All right. Well, I wanted to save a little bit of time for our uh, time this evening because I, I think um, this may take a little bit of time, but I hope it's, it's not boring. <laughs> but let me begin by um, reading one passage that we will refer to. I've already read one in the meditation, but I will, I will read another uh, where our Lord Jesus Christ is telling us quite plainly, at least here, that what he is saying is God's word. Okay, so John 12, verses 48 through 50. Jesus says, He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. Why? For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. A very important statement on the part of Christ. What he is saying is precisely what the Father wants him to say. His Father, of course, being God. Jesus is claiming that his words are the word of God. Now, that is going to be just one point of what we're going to look at this evening. We're going to see... Uh, several others, but when we're doing topicals, we don't have one verse that sort of incorporates uh, everything we see. But let's just look by way of review, and this for two reasons, because it has been a couple weeks since we've dealt with the subject, and also because I, I want to try to keep fresh in our minds what it is we, we have seen. Now, so far we have seen this, that God reveals himself in the creation, okay? He reveals that he is, and he also tells us a good deal about what, what he's like. You know, John Gerstner once said this in one of his lectures. He said that, that natural theologians can learn more, and he may have been referring to Thomas Aquinas in particular, but I, I don't remember that for sure. But natural theologians can learn more about God from nature than most Christians do from reading their Bibles. Now, that's not because God reveals more of himself in nature. It's because most Christians don't study their Bibles, okay? So what he was saying was, we need to study our Bibles. But that doesn't mean that the creation doesn't reveal a great deal about God. Now, from the creation, we know that God is. Very simply, he is the only reasonable explanation for everything that we do, in fact, see. And here's where I want to just again, just just, you know, briefly uh, describe again the arguments, okay? We, we know that, that God exists. We know that there must be something that is eternal because there is something now. If there's something now, there must have always been something. That he must be infinite because there cannot be any place where there's nothing, so whatever it is that has existed must exist everywhere, and we know there's, there's really no limit to where, you know, it, God is infinite. We know he must be one because, if you're, first of all, if you're infinite, you have to be everything, okay? I know that's hard to understand. That has created some problems in Christian theology, but it, it must be true. We do know that if there were two infinites, there, well, there can't be two infinites because they would limit each other, make each other finite. And if you have two finites, you cannot put them together to make an infinite because finite falls infinitely short of what is infinite, right? So there must be one infinite. There can't be just a whole bunch of finite things. Um, he must be independent because if he is the infinite eternal being that's always existed, then there's nothing, and he's the only one, there can't be anything else that he could depend on for his existence, he must be the only one, and he must be independent, and he must be unchangeable. Remember, because if he's the only one who exists, there's nothing else that would make him exist or make him change. There's no, there'd be no reason to change. We saw that he can't be the material universe because the material universe is not these things. It's not eternal. It's not infinite. It's not one. It's not independent, and it's not unchangeable. As a matter of fact, it's just the opposite. We saw that he's personal, he's self-aware, he's intelligent, he's purposeful, he's moral, and that's because we are. You know, the, the effect cannot be greater than the cause, right? So whatever is in us must be in what caused us. 
So we know these things must be true of God, and he has to be the one who caused us because he's the only one who could have done this, okay? And we know the creation itself, uh, the matter of the universe does not have these attributes. So we know the one who created it. that and created us must have them. Then we saw that he's morally good because he's given us a conscience that rewards us when we do what is good, but punishes us when we do what we think is wrong. That he is benevolent because we see in this creation that he's given us much more pleasure and good things than he has bad things. We see he's angry because of all the disease, death, and various other catastrophes that are ongoing. And we can conclude from the fact that our conscience tells us he loves what's good, and yet we do what's wrong, that that anger is directed at the wrong things that we do. And that God is just, that being good and being infinitely good, he must judge those who commit these crimes. But since he doesn't judge us right away, since he gives us a lot of time, I mean, most people, uh, Scripture does tell us that, you know, the average life is 70 to 80 years. That's a long time. He's patient, which means that there does appear to be, on his part, the desire to, uh, to, for us to repent, giving us the time, the space of time in which to do it. And we know, of course, from his word that that is, in fact, what he is doing, Okay. Now, that's what we've seen from the creation. That can all just be from, from what God has revealed in nature. We don't even need the Bible to see these things, although we would have to admit this, that everyone who has seen this revelation without having the Scriptures does tend to misinterpret it. But once we do get Scripture, we do see that it is exactly as, his, as He's revealed Himself in the creation. But let's not forget this. Even though they may twist these things in their minds because of their sins. Um, they all have enough information. They all know God exists. They all know what God wants. And that's why they are without excuse. Paul says, there's no one in the world that is going to perish because they haven't heard the gospel, because they haven't had the chance to believe in Jesus Christ. They will perish because they know God. And yet they do not give him thanks uh, but rather worship and serve the, the, the creation rather than the creator. They will perish for their sins, okay, not because they haven't heard the gospel. All right, so that's the first thing we set out to prove. The second thing we set out to prove is that the Bible is God's word. Now, we did see a couple of things about that. First of all, that when we're doing apologetics, we shouldn't start with the Bible. We shouldn't start by trying to prove that the Bible is the Word of God and then trying to prove from the Bible that God exists. Now, I hope you remember that particular part. R.C. reminded us that those who reject the Bible today do so because it makes the claim that God exists and that miracles actually took place. Now, they presuppose that God doesn't exist. I mean, that's their presupposition. That's their basic assumption. They believe that they can explain everything that they see without him. And their explanation is this, that the material universe just at some point in, I don't know if you can even call it time, just popped into existence from nothing. And then it organized itself into everything we see today through random collisions of atoms and then once life somehow was formed from that, mutation, and then natural selection over a long period of time. They believe that if you have these things happening, if you have stuff and you have energy and you have enough time that anything can happen. But you know, the fact is that uh, experience, science actually tells us not only that that wouldn't happen, but just the opposite would happen. Everything's running down, it's not running up. But that's what they believe, and they believe that because there is no other explanation if they reject God, and they reject Him out of hand. And the reason they do that, Paul says, is because they hate Him. It's not because there isn't evidence, it's because they hate Him. So R.C. rejected that first way of going about apologetics, okay? And remember, in their view, if there's no God, there can be no Word of God, and that's why we need first to prove that God exists. So moving on from there, we looked at two different approaches to apologetics. One is called presuppositionalism, and it starts with the assumption 
that the Bible is the Word of God. That's what the presupposition is, okay? Presupposing something means that out of the gate, from the very beginning, this is what I assume to be the truth, okay? Presuppositionalism says that basic assumption is that the Bible is God's Word. And so what they do in order to do apologetics is they, um, they will step into their opponent's worldview, like we could step into the atheist worldview, the one that I just described, and we could point out all the absurdities of that view. So you step into their view and you say, this is unreasonable and uh, illogical, and there's no way in, in, you know, no matter how much time you have, this could never possibly happen. And then you invite them to step into your worldview, and you show them the consistency of what the Bible says with what we see. Okay? So that's... Um, that is the way presuppositionalism works. Now, Sproul and Gerstner criticize that approach as being circular because what, they, what they're saying is that if you start by assuming the truth of what you're trying to prove, then you've included you know, your conclusion in your premise. So your, your, your conclusion and your, your beginning point and your end point are the same. So you end up reasoning in, in a circle. And Technically, in, in, in logic, a, a, a circular argument is an argument that self-destructs. Uh, a logician would not accept that, okay? That's what they were saying. So in classical apologetics, they go about it a different way, and that's the way we're doing it right now. Sproul and Gerstner don't believe this to be circular, but rather you start at point A and you end up at point B, beginning where all men actually do start in their reasoning. And what, the way that, what they do is they start like this, um, they're, they're, they begin to think, and as Gerstner said, as soon as they begin to think, they begin to think about God. That's kind of an interesting statement, isn't it? But what they, what they think is this, here I am in this world, how did I get here? I know that I didn't bring myself into existence, so something else must have. Well, it was my parents? Well, yes, but they also have a beginning. Where did they start? And then you reason back, all the way to the ultimate starting point, which is God. So you begin thinking about your surroundings, who you are, where you're from, how all these things came about. You gather information that's, that's basically reliable through the only way we have to gain information, which is through our senses. And then we begin to reason uh, with uh, our senses or with the information we gain through our senses with the other two principles, the law of non-contradiction and the law of cause and effect. Law of non-contradiction means, you know, something can't be A and not A at the same time in the same relationship. If I say this is a bottle, then it, it can't be at the same time not a bottle, okay? Otherwise, I haven't said anything that means anything. If you, you know, the law of non-contradiction is necessary if you're going to be able to say something is anything and, and mean something by it. And then the law of causality, that whatever effect we see must have a sufficient cause, a cause that is great enough to explain it, okay? And so what they do is, is you know, and, and really, as they would say, this is the way that everyone who has ever come to the conclusion that God exists, this is the way they do it, you know? Not the way the presuppositionalists would argue, the Bible is the Word of God. They come to that conclusion apart from the Bible. Paul says that everybody sees that he exists, that, that information that God has put in the creation gets through. Everyone knows, and they know it apart from the Bible. Okay, so they have done it. This is how they have done it, okay, in the way that, um, that R.C. and, and uh, Gerstner uh, are explaining it to us in their particular method. Now, from here... We reason then to the Bible as the Word of God. If we have a God, then at least we have the possibility that there could be a Word of God. And so what we want to see is how they approach it. Now, the first thing they do is this, and that's what we're going to look at this evening for our remaining time. First of all, that the Bible makes that claim. It claims to be the Word of God. Okay, if it doesn't make that claim, there's no reason to try to prove it. Okay, so we're trying to prove the claim that it makes. Now, this is not the same thing. I'm sorry if I'm confusing some of you. <laughs> but this is not the same thing as presuppositionalism. Okay, to begin 
with the claim the Bible makes because the presuppositionalist begins with the assumption that that claim is true, okay? It claims it, and it is true. It is God's Word. It has His full authority, and they use it in that way without proving that its claims are true. That's the difference, okay? In this approach, again, Sproul and Gerser, we begin with the claim that the Bible makes to be God's Word. Again, if it didn't make that claim, there wouldn't be any reason to attempt to try to prove it. Then we examine whether that claim is true by looking at the evidence. And then once we have looked at the evidence and see that it proves the case, then we submit to its authority. And let me just suggest to you that too, I think, is exactly how everyone who has ever submitted to the Word of God actually was brought to submit to it, is through the evidence. And one thing which, which um, we'll look at uh, down the road is the subjective element. You know, I will make reference to it a little bit this evening, but the subjective element is the Spirit of God does bear witness to the fact that the Bible is the Word of God, not apart from the evidence, though, but through the evidence. Okay. All right, so let's see. Okay, so we begin with the claim, we examine it, and then we submit to it. And they, they pointed out that regardless, again, of which approach we might believe is right. This really is the way that everyone comes to understand the Bible as the Word of God. So, first of all, what does the Bible claim? Does it claim to be God's Word? Now, I want us to consider the evidence that it does. And I don't know if you've ever done this before, but um, I, I know when we're talking about canon, okay, not the kind you, you, you shoot on the 4th of July or you know, that, that you were used in the Civil War, but we're talking about, you know, the canon or the rule of, of, of the church, uh, which is Scripture. How do we know which books are included in the canon? And that's, that's really what this is about as well this evening. How do we know these books are viewed as the Word of God, okay? How do we know they're the Word of God? Well, okay, so we're going to touch on that somewhat uh, this evening. But let's begin with this. Jesus makes the claim that the entire Old Testament is God's Word. Okay, now that shouldn't surprise us. Usually there isn't any question regarding the Old Testament. It really has to do with the New Testament, but we're going to look at that too. Jesus, first of all, claims the entire Old Testament is God's Word. He says in John 10... Verses 35 and 36, which was the passage we looked two weeks ago and we read for our meditation. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God. Now the key statement here is the scripture cannot be broken. Now by scripture, you need to realize that Jesus here is talking about the graphe or the sacred writings or what the Jews meant by this word, which was the Old Testament. They meant the entire Old Testament. And the Jews viewed the, the Old Testament as the very word of God. That's why they called it Scripture. Jesus is calling uh, the Old Testament Scripture, and he's viewing it the way the Jews viewed it which is the Word of God. When he says it can't be broken, what he means is it can never be set aside, it can never be annulled, it can never be invalidated. It must always stand, and it will always stand, and the reason is because it's Scripture, because it is the very Word of God. Now, he says the same thing in the Sermon on the Mount. Remember that very familiar passage, Matthew 5, 17 through 20, where Jesus, preaching to Jewish audience, says, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever keeps and teaches them 
He shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And then he says those very sobering words. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I could say a lot about that, but let me just say Jesus here, I don't believe is talking about imputed righteousness. I think he's talking about personal righteousness. And really, every believer should have more than a hypocritical righteousness, right? They should be obeying the law from the heart. And that's what he's saying. They will do. We will do. But notice, the law and the prophets is simply a shorthand way of referring to the Old Testament. From which Jesus says, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter, not the smallest stroke shall pass away from it until it is entirely fulfilled. Okay? And then he goes on to talk about how in the kingdom of heaven, right now, which Jesus has brought, and, and I think he's referring also to the time past his death and resurrection, whoever annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others shall be called least in the kingdom, but whoever keeps and teaches them shall be called great. In other words, they continue, and they will continue as long as heaven and earth continue, okay, because it is the Word of God. Okay, so Jesus sees the Old Testament as the Word of God. Now, Paul also claims the Old Testament to be God's Word. He writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, verses 14 through 17. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And then, all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. The word Scripture here means the same thing that Jesus meant by it. It's talking about the sacred writings. It's talking about the Old Testament. He says all Scripture, all the Old Testament at least, and I think he would also be referring to anything that may have been written by that time by New Testament authors, but it is inspired by God, which means literally breathed out by God. And he says, is the source of authority for the church. We are to believe, you know, everything that we are to believe regarding God and his plan of reconciliation for mankind and how we are to live once we have been reconciled. It is the authority. By the way, Paul is referring to the Old Testament. And oftentimes in churches today, people want to saw off Christians, want to saw off the Old Testament and, and make it you know, irrelevant. Um, dispensationalism in particular, because they believe it was for a different dispensation, a different people, doesn't apply to us. I mean, I had professors in the college I went to who said that what Jesus said had nothing to do with us because he was speaking to Jews. Ah, but that's, he was speaking to Jews, but he was speaking to Jews about the kingdom he was bringing. And then Paul tells us that God's bringing Gentiles into that same kingdom. So yes, it has very much to do uh, with us. <clears throat> but the Old Testament is the word of God and it is still authoritative, okay? It is God's Word. So Jesus and Paul are telling us, first of all, they're making the claim the entire Old Testament is God's Word, and that covers the first 39 books of the Bible. Now, secondly, Jesus goes on to claim that what He says is also God's Word. And I already stole some of my own thunder here by telling you what the text that I read meant, but let me read it again. He who rejects me does not, and does not receive my sayings as one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father told me. Now notice, he's saying that he says only what his Father commands. So every word that he speaks is the word of God. And not only that, but he also told us that everything he did was what he saw the Father doing. He does the works of his Father. He speaks the words of his Father. He is the incarnation and revelation, you know, 
uh, to us of the nature of the Father. So when we see Him, when we hear Him, what we are seeing and hearing is exactly what the Father is like. So what He says is the Word of God. He says in John 14, 10, Do you not believe that I am in the Father? And the Father is in me. The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Now, at the very least, this is an endorsement of the four Gospels, which are four records, four eyewitness testimonies, and Luke's includes many more than just one. Actually, he wasn't an eyewitness, but he interviewed many eyewitnesses. But they are the records of what Jesus did and what Jesus taught. So, by claiming that he's speaking the Word of God, the Gospels, too, are the Word of God. And also, it's interesting that Paul, we we just take this for granted, but Paul believed that Jesus was speaking God's Word. He certainly quotes Jesus on more than one occasion. He says to Timothy in his first letter this, For the Scripture says, in 1 Timothy 5, 18, You shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. And that is a direct quote from Deuteronomy 25.4. And Paul is calling that Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, Scripture. But the second quote, and the laborer is worthy of his wages, is a quote from Luke 10.7. It's a quote from the Lord Jesus, which he also calls Scripture. So again, Paul is looking at what Jesus says as Scripture, not surprisingly. So, Jesus and Paul look at the Old Testament as the Word of God. Jesus looked at what he said, and Paul looked at what Jesus said as the Word of God. Thirdly, Jesus promised his apostles that he would give him or them the Spirit, who would not only help them remember what he said, which is very important when it came to writing the Gospels, but would continue to teach them and reveal to them God's truth. Okay, he says, Jesus says in John 14, 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Okay, do you want a further endorsement of two of the Gospels? You have it here. Matthew was one of those apostles, and so was John. And Jesus promised to give them his Spirit to help them write this. Now, I believe this would also apply to Mark's gospel because he received his information from Peter. You know, it's, it's believed that Mark, Mark is the John Mark that abandoned Paul and Barnabas on that first missionary journey, that Paul didn't want to take along with him on the second missionary journey that caused that division so that he and Barnabas went their separate ways, but they were later reconciled. But that John, Mark, who abandoned them, is the Mark who eventually wrote this gospel. He became a close associate of Peter who was promised, again, the work of the Holy Spirit um, to, teach, to re- help remind him and to teach him everything that, um, that he would need to give to the church, that he would have to communicate to the church. So this would be an endorsement. Matthew, John, as well as the writings of Peter and the writings of of Mark, and I would say also of Paul's writings, because even though he was not one of the immediate 12, uh, he was the one, I, I, at least I believe, that was chosen to replace the one that um, betrayed the Lord Jesus. And we know that uh, he was the very last of the apostles. Uh, I had a New Testament professor who used this passage, 1 Corinthians 15, to prove that um, Paul would be the last of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let me just read this quickly, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 11. Paul writes, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, that is to Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, He appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. And this James we're going to look at, this is the author of the letter uh, that's called James in in the Bible. Then to all the apostles, again, before he ascends, he, he appears to them one last time. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also 
For I am the least of the apostles, not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But notice he says, last of all, he appeared to me. Okay, um, was the last appearance of, of uh, Christ to anyone. But remember that those who would be apostles had to see the risen Christ. And that's the reason why Jesus appears to Paul. So he is included in that promise Jesus made to his apostles that he would give them the spirit who would bring to their minds and teach them the things they needed to write. Paul himself recognized and claimed that his own writings were scripture. He writes in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37, if anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. There are times, you know, there's an example in 1 Corinthians 7 where Paul adds to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ when he says that I say not the Lord, and what he meant by that is, you know, this is something I'm adding, this is not something Jesus said. And, you know, Jesus had said that if a brother or sister, you know, has, they're married and their spouse commits adultery, they can divorce them and remarry. But Paul says, I'm going to add something more to that. If there's a believer married to an unbeliever and the unbeliever departs, they're not bound to that unbeliever, they too are free to marry. Paul is adding to what Christ said. And how could he do that unless he had the authority to do that? Well, he recognized he had that authority, and Peter recognized who... We know he recognized his own authority, but he recognized Paul's authority and put his writings on par with Scripture, with the Old Testament Scripture in 2 Peter 3, verses 14 through 16. He writes this, Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, that is, the new heavens and the new earth, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand. We, we can't relate to that, right? I mean, Paul's pretty straightforward. <laughs> Just kidding. Which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the scriptures, to their own destruction. So he's saying they distort Paul's writings just like they do the rest of Scripture. So he is telling us that Paul's writings are Scripture. Now, if we also understand that Luke was Paul's close companion, even as Mark was Peter's, then we have Paul's apostolic endorsement of his writings as well, okay, which, you know, we, we saw that, um, you know, Luke, Luke wrote uh, the Gospel of Luke and you know, he was giving to us these eyewitness testimonies of what Jesus said. We know that Jesus was speaking the Word of God, but Luke also wrote the book of Acts. That's why when we're talking about New Testament canon, which books are included, we say they must be written by an apostle or a close associate of the apostle. One other thing which we'll just touch on is the church needs to have recognized the voice of God speaking in those writings and received them you know, like the Jews received the, the Old Testament scriptures and recognized them as the Word of God, so the New Testament church receives the Word of God because they recognize it as the Word of God. One of the ways, of course, is apostolic authorship, another way, close associate of an, of an apostle, but another way, the internal consistency, the, the majesty, all the different things that R.C. told us John Calvin said about the character of Scripture. They see the Spirit of God speaking through those books. So again, we have then uh, Jesus promising His apostles that they would remember His Word and they would be taught other things, and these are the things they wrote down. Now, fourthly, Jesus not only promised the Spirit to teach His apostles His truth, He also promised the Spirit would show them that which was yet coming. He says in John 16, verse 13, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. 
Now again, so this is an endorsement of those prophetic, you know, portions of the New Testament letters and the book of Revelation as a whole. He will disclose what is to come. That, that's exactly what the book of Revelation is about. Remember, in it, Jesus not only shows John what's going to happen in 70 AD, God's judgment on the Jews, the destruction of, the, of Jerusalem and the temple, which was 40 years in the future, uh, not from John's perspective, but from, from Jesus, but what he was going to bring at his second coming, the new heavens and the new earth. Again, that as well as the different pieces of the picture that uh, Jesus revealed to Paul and Peter that they included in their writings. Now, we already saw that John was one of Jesus' apostles and that Jesus promised the, the Holy Spirit uh, to remind him and to show him things to come, so that would be an endorsement of the book of Revelation. But R.C. had another argument, which was interesting, regarding the book of Revelation. And that'll be uh, important also for what we're going to look at in just a moment. But John closes the book of Revelation with what is called the canonical curse. And that is the warning not to add or to take away from anything that was written. Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city, which are written in this book. Now, John, we have to say at the very least, John believed that what he wrote was the word of God. Otherwise, he would not have put that canonical curse in there because that curse only applies to what God has said, only what God has written. Uh, just a couple of examples of this from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 4.2. God says, you shall not add to the word which I am commanding you. Actually, Moses is saying this, but it's, it's, these words come from the Lord. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandment of the Lord your God which I command you. Solomon writes in Proverbs, actually in Proverbs 30, I'm not sure it's Solomon at this point, but again, an inspired author, verses five, uh, 5 and 6. Every word of God is tested. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, or he will reprove you, and you will be proved a liar. And I don't know if you noticed, but in the Sermon on the Mount, that portion I read just a little bit earlier, um, when Jesus was saying not one jot or tittle or one letter or stroke shall pass away from the law. When he says this, whoever annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same should be called least in the kingdom of heaven. To annul something is to take it away, right? But whoever keeps and teaches it, he should be called great in the kingdom of heaven. That is the canonical curse. Jesus is saying that his words are the very words of God. <coughs> Now, the fact that Revelation is the very last New Testament book written, even if we accept the earlier date, it's still the last book. It may be an indication that God intended to close the canon with this canonical warning, which means it would cover all the books that he had already given. And by the way, even if that's not true, if everything that is in the Old Testament is the Word of God, it applies. If everything in the New Testament is the Word of God, it also applies to that. Now, we have seen from, from what we just looked at that every book of the, of the Bible is covered as, as having a claim to being the Word of God except for three books, okay? <laughs> three New Testament books, Hebrews, James, and Jude. The only ones that weren't written by, again, the gospel writers, by Paul and... Um, uh, Peter and John. Okay, so it's interesting that Luther considered these books to be disputed along with the book of Revelation, which I think we've already shown had, there's reason for it to be included. Now, he, he said they were disputed. He didn't say they weren't the Word of God, but he said there was, there was, you know, there was some concern about them. So Luther, in his German translation, put all of these books at the end. 
Okay, now we know that the Jude and Revelation are at the end anyway. So what he did was he moved uh, Hebrews and James past Peter and the epistles of John and pushed them all the way back to, to Jude and Revelation. Okay, now why did he do that? Because, first of all, um, the authorship of, one, of really all three of these books, not, not Revelation maybe, but, um, or maybe, maybe it's possible in his day. No, I don't think so. Anyway, but they were disputed. But also, as you know, James and Hebrews contained some things that Luther had a hard time accepting, uh, swallowing, as being consistent with the rest of Scripture. In James, where James almost seems to be saying that we're justified not by faith alone, but also by works, and I think you, you understand the debate that's ongoing there. But why Hebrews? Because of Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6 says that if you reach a certain point in your understanding of God's Word, but then you fall away from it, it almost appears as though there's no second chances. Luther did not believe that, so he thought that perhaps the, the book of Hebrews may not necessarily be the Word of God, but he wasn't quite sure. So the question is, why do we accept them? Okay. Well, we can say this. James and Jude, okay, the, the authors of the two the two epistles, the letters in question, they were half-brothers of Jesus. <laughs> so they were close associates of an apostle, <laughs> you know, the apostle of our, of our faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's, he's the primary one, okay? So that lends some endorsement, you know, to their writings. Now, when it comes to Hebrews, we're not quite sure who the author was, but his writings do appear... Uh, that, that he was a close associate to Paul. As a matter of fact, for many years, the church believed that Paul wrote that letter. But I think that there are stylistic differences. It's just not quite the same, doesn't read the same, isn't structured the same, not the way Paul would write. And he also calls Timothy a brother rather than a son, the author to the Hebrews. So there's been some debate as to who the author was, but whoever he was, he does appear to have known Paul. So, again, that connection. And then the fact that none of these epistles contain anything contrary. When correctly understood, they agree perfectly with the whole of Scripture. And the fact that the church throughout the last 2,000 years, I think, although I think the, the canon itself came together, I want to say, in the 300s. But they were circulating and they were recognized as the Word of God before that. They were just simply, they had to define what the canon was when this uh, heretic named Marcion, who was denying certain writings, and he put together his own canon of Scripture, they said, no, no, these books may be the Word of God, but there are other books, and so the church had to put their feet down. That's when the canon actually was uh, determined uh, as, you know, I guess you'd say a list was made. But these books were circulating and recognized as the Word of God from the time they were written, with, with the exception of some questions during the time of the Reformation by Luther, okay? All right, but they were recognized as the Word of God because this church heard God speaking in them. So let's draw all of this to a conclusion. This is the point. <laughs> the Bible claims to be the Word of God, okay? Now, the question we need to ask is, is that claim enough to prove it? Well, here's the debate between presuppositionalism and classical apologetics. We could say, yes, it, it, it does, and on the other hand, no, it doesn't. Yes, it does from the presuppositional perspective and from a biblical perspective because it is the Word of God, okay? If, if the Bible is the Word of God and it claims to be the Word of God, what it says is true, and we are bound to accept it, okay? That, we have to say, <laughs> that is true, okay? But, no, in the sense that that claim really needs to be proven before anyone's going to accept it. I mean, it had to be proven to you, didn't it, before you accepted it? It had to be proven to me. That didn't change the character of the Word of God. It's still the Word of God, but we're talking about how you show somebody that it is the Word of God.
it, it definitely proves itself to be the Word of God, but that requires evidence. Now, the reason why R.C. and Sproul, excuse me, R.C. Sproul and Gerstner took this position is because they recognized there are other books that claim to be the Word of God. And we don't accept them just because they say they are. Of course, the presupposition was to say, well, we shouldn't accept them because they're not the Word of God. And that's true, they're not, and we shouldn't accept them. But how do we know? <laughs> okay. Well, you know, the Quran, the Book of Mormon, the other writings of Joseph Smith, the, the Hindu Vedas, they claim to be the Word of God, but all of them contradict each other. They contradict themselves, and they certainly contradict the Bible. Okay? They can't all be the Word of God. So how do we sort it out? It's not enough to make that claim. There has to be a reason for accepting the claim. So the question is, how do we prove it? Now, here's where the question that R.C. asked becomes relevant. If the Bible were not the Word of God, if it wasn't divinely inspired, could it still be true? Could it still be true? You know, what do you think the answer to that question is? Does it have to be inspired to be true? Is it that everything that everybody writes that isn't inspired is just totally fallacious and wrong? You know, that, that isn't the case. It could still be a reliable record of what it claims to record, uh, the words of Christ, uh, the, you know, what took place in the Old Testament, uh, what they believed, at least regarding what, what they thought God was saying. You know, it could be a reliable record of those things. A history book doesn't have to be inspired in order to be reliable. But as R.C. said, the fact that it claims, the Bible claims to be the Word of God does raise the stakes somewhat but it doesn't have to be inspired to be true. So next time what we're going to do is this, and the next step is to consider that the Bible, if we just accept it as a trustworthy, what he called basically reliable record of what Jesus said and did, that we can arrive at the conclusion uh, that it is the Word of God. Okay, so that's how we're going to build the argument not by it, what it claims regarding itself, but why we should accept those claims to be true. And, and again, if you remember, if you were there for when we went through it before, this, this is still review, but I'm, I'm trying to fill it out a little bit more, trying to enlarge it so that we can, by being exposed and hopefully saturated with it, I hope you feel like you're totally saturated <laughs> with with these things, and maybe we'll remember some of these things, you know, when it comes time to, to use them. But also, so we'll be convinced beyond any doubt, we should already be by the Holy Spirit, that the Bible is His Word so that we'll respond to it the way that we need to respond to it, the way God calls us to respond to it as the words of His mouth breathed out for our, our good. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for just a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's, um, let's ask the Lord to help us uh, to do that.